We have about 150 people logged in right now, which is great. And today's topic is assessing how libraries contribute to student success. I know I'm especially interested in this topic because I'm all the time giving tours of my library to our students. And I point at the reference desk and I say, go ask the librarian for help and you will get a better grade. But I have absolutely no data to back that up. It's completely anecdotal. So hopefully I will learn some things uh, today to help me back uh, my uh, story that I tell all my students. <laughs> Looks like we're still having a lot of sound issues, but we'll keep going. Um, the facilitators today are myself, Emily Daly, and Rebecca Blackiston. We are the three that put these on for you. We uh, get the people that are the panelists up to speed and um, promote this thing. Unfortunately, Rebecca couldn't be here today, so instead we have Drew Smith helping out with tech issues today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it along to Beatrice Hardy from Salisbury University, and she will moderate our panel today. Thank you, Julie. Um, obviously, the question of proving value, the value of libraries has become more and more important for us. And uh, consequently, uh, actually in 2012, the ACRL got an IMLS grant for assessment in action, academic libraries, and student success. And both people who are participating in that program and others are very concerned uh, about how to prove the value of libraries. Okay. And uh, I put together a panel, because I'm having that issue myself, uh, so I put together a panel of people uh, who are taking slightly different approaches. And what we're going to do is have uh, each of them speak for a few minutes, basically summarizing what you've already seen in the papers they submitted. Uh, and then we'll have time for question and answer. And so you can end discussion. Uh, the bulk of this should be discussion. And we're going to um, have plenty of time for question and answer, which you can submit through the chat. And so I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Eric Ackerman from Radford University. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Let me be sure. And uh, we, uh, I'm part of Radford University. We're a regional university located in the southwestern part of Virginia. We're actually only about 18 miles from Virginia Tech. And so we're often overshadowed by them. We're not a research one. We're primarily an undergraduate teaching university with about 8,000 undergraduates and about 1,000 grads. Uh, we focused so far on assessing the library's contribution to student success, which might be helpful if I move that forward. There we are. Um, in two areas so far, uh, freshman orientation and the core curriculum. Uh, before I get too far along, I want to point out for those that don't know already that student success and retention are not precisely defined in the literature and can often be used interchangeably. So for our purposes, just to sort of clear the air about what I'm talking about, student retention is considered re-enrollment until graduation. That's also known as persistence. And then student success, we use GPA as a shorthand for that. Uh, our freshman orientation course is known as University 100. We've been participating as a library in University 100 since 2003. Uh, we had so much favorable response from the instructors that they made us one of the few required parts of that curriculum. And we've been using a game format to it as our session since 2005. The primary focus on assessing the impact of this is we're looking at student information confidence, which is another way of saying library anxiety. You may know it as that as well. And the literature is fairly clear about uh, the role of student information confidence, and it's basically the willingness to use the library resources effectively. And this is a demonstrated factor in student success and retention. 
Uh, the core curriculum, we were involved from the very beginning in the core curriculum when it was developed in, I've got that written down somewhere. I think it was 2008. And we actually had a seat on the organizing committee, so we were sort of embedded in how it developed. We're primarily involved with uh, the core A, which is the freshman composition and the critical thinking and communication parts. Uh, there's also a core capstone aspect, which is a senior paper or project. Our participation is actually strongest in the core 102, which is the research paper course and core 201, which is critical thinking. And we've gone round and round about the best ways to evaluate these and assess them, and so we decided to do the citation project, which was an analysis of core A papers from core 102 and 201, and the core capstone, and see what difference, if any, there was in the areas that uh, library instruction developed or worked in. And uh, I can discuss more about that if, if anyone's interested in the, the gory details. Um, suffice it to say, for those that have read our, our, my narrative, there was depressingly little difference between the freshman and the senior level papers. Uh, so in summary, our impact, uh, we've been only assessing the impact on retention over the last two years. We've doing a, done a great deal of instruction assessment uh, since 2005. So we've sort of redirected a lot of what we were doing to see if we could broaden the impact. Uh, so far, all I think we can say with any confidence is we have indirect impact. That is, we impact positively programs that have a demonstrated impact on student retention themselves. For example, the University 100, we contribute to the University 100, which studies have, internal studies have shown have a positive impact on student retention. Uh, same with the core curriculum. We contribute uh, as part of the core but we can't certainly claim total credit for it. Part of the problem is an inability to, to track individual student success over time. And this is an institutional level issue. Obviously, you will find out from people who follow, particularly University of Minnesota Twin Cities has found a much more effective way of doing this. We're still wrestling with confidentiality issues, both at the university level and at the library level for the student data, and we also experience a fair amount of student turnover at the lower and upper ends of the GPA curve. Uh, the upper end students, alas, transfer elsewhere, and the lower end just simply don't make it. Um, so right now we're casting around for suitable metrics and instruments that will allow us to tease out, you know, what exactly is the library impacting. Um, and maybe push it beyond just our instruction program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. And we are going to move now to Jan and Shane at the University of Minnesota. So if you could please give us a brief summary of how your library has been measuring the contribution to student success. I think Eric has to move the ball. Sorry, where are we going next? To Jan. To Jan. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Passing the ball. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Shane Ackard, and I'm with Jan Franson. And we're from the University of Minnesota, and we're going to talk about the uh, study that we've done at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Uh, since 2011, we have been uh, uh, successfully tying um, student use of library resources to student success measures. Uh, we aren't the only ones on campus to do that, though. Uh, before we even started, the University Rec Center here on campus uh, did a pretty landmark study uh, that tied uh, Rec Center usage to um, student success measures such as GPA increase or higher retention. And they used some of their results uh, to justify a $60 million expansion. So uh, there are times when studies like this can have a big impact on the institutions that are, that are doing or the departments that are doing this work. 
Uh, we didn't exactly want to build a new library, but we did want to move away from just assuming that libraries have an impact on student success um, and move into uh, um, real data. So how did we do that? We worked with uh, all the layers of data that we have access to. Uh, you at your own institutions probably gather a whole lot of uh, data, uh, probably mainly hit counts, on different usage levels of different uh, areas of library uh, usage and transactions. For us, um, we started to identify um, areas where we could uh, not only gather hit counts, but we could also track um, individual or person identifiable information. And, and doing that, then, we could partner with the Office of Institutional Research on campus because they need to know who are the people that are using these resources so they can tell us then stuff like the demographics data of those users and then also the, uh, the performance data, again, uh, tying the usage of our resources to uh, GPA and retention. So a uh, question that we usually get about that is that how did we maintain the privacy of our users um, while still uh, gathering personally identifiable information? How did we toe that line? Uh, so what we came up with, the method we came up with, is that we would track specific users but not the actual uh, title or items that they used. We would tie it to broad use. So we tracked that user X used a book but not the title of the book. Uh, we tracked that uh, user Y used an e-journal but not the title and, and user Z used a workshop but not the actual workshop that they, that they attended. And with that, then, we were able to track a number of uh, library uh, transaction points. Um, for example, uh, we tracked uh, circulation statistics through our all of catalog, now Alma. We also tracked the ILL usage. Uh, we tracked the digital usage of our, our resources, uh, databases, e-journals, and e-books, and websites. Again, the fact that in a specific University of Minnesota Internet ID used a database, but not a specific database. We also tracked uh, workshops. Um, course integrated um, uh, instruction sessions where a librarian would go into a, a particular course and teach the students there. And then also online tutorials. We also track reference data, but not face-to-face uh, -face reference, but online reference. And then we also have a, uh, a peer uh, research consultant service where uh, undergraduates will um, help each other uh, use library resources. We also tracked workstation data, and this is really the only data point we have that tracked library as place, um, but uh, was still um, an effective measure. So what we did then is we packaged up all of the transactions that we could capture in a semester, um, and depending on the semester, that was probably between either 1.5 million transactions or 2 million transactions, and we shipped it off to the Office of Institutional Research, who became a very important partner in helping us uh, um, figure out what this data meant, who these users are, um, and again, how we could tie that to student success. So this graph uh, demonstrates uh, the usage level that, we, that they were able to tell us about uh, uh, who was using our resources. And you'll note that uh, for any department or college on campus, no, there's no usage that drops below 60%. In fact, we found that for undergraduates in particular, 76% of undergrads made use of the library. Uh, in the fall of 2011, which was a, a fantastic number to see. Uh, we also found that 100% uh, of pharmacy professional students made use of the libraries. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, um, the Carlson School of Business, there was higher undergrad usage than professional or grad student usage. This is just a quick snapshot of the kinds of things that we were able to find out concerning who our users are. I'm going to turn it over to Jan now, who's going to talk more about uh, tying those users to uh, student success. Well, the other part of our collaboration with the Office of Institutional Research was not only that they knew how to pull the demographics together, but that they knew how to do some really great statistical things with that information. So starting with our data and adding in the institutional data, our analyst who we worked with in the Office of Institutional Research, Chris Soria, took that and took just new high school students, those first-time, full-time students, simply because that's, they're the easiest ones to analyze this sort of thing for. And she controlled for a lot of demographic characteristics for their college environment, things like do they live in the residence hall or not, and then for prior academics, did they come in for a with AP credits and what was their ACT score and that sort of thing. And controlling for all of those, then we looked at outcomes for GPA and retention, again, the easiest things to look at when you're talking about student success. And then also she pulled in information from the Seiru survey, which I'll talk about in a minute in a different slide. 
Well, taking all of that into account, we did find this is just a, a summary of, of um, all of the findings, and I won't go through them, but we did find that there was a strong positive correlation between library use and both GPA and retention into both uh, fall to spring semester and then to the following fall semester as well. I mentioned a survey a minute ago. These are some of the surveys that our Office of Institutional Research um, gives around campus. A couple of them that we've worked with so far with our library data are this one, the student experience in a research university, which our undergraduates take, and this one, the cooperative institutional research program, or the SERP, which freshmen take, and in our case, it's freshmen during orientation, so it's a paper and pencil survey um, before they've ever taken a class, and it's about um, where self-reported things about what they did in high school and that sort of thing. So for the SERU, the student experience in a research university, uh, Krista grouped the questions together and, uh, and gave indicators for each individual who answered as far as how academically engaged they were and what was their scholarship indicator. And both of those were positively, significantly correlated with their library use. Now we're Anne, could, could I interrupt a second to ask, yes. uh, we have a question from the audience for clarification. By users, do you mean visitors to the building or users of the databases? Sorry, I tend to use the word users for any of our patrons. Um, we are, uh, for these studies, we've been looking only at our students and primarily at undergraduates, um, but it could be faculty, staff, uh, any patron of the library. And it's anyone that we can capture an internet ID for, so the ID that they use to access their email or their register for classes, we can we also use that for them to log into library resources. And okay, uh, users of any physical. aspect of the library. So it's not just physical visitors? Correct. To the okay, thank you. Okay, so the other survey that I mentioned was the SERP, and it identified things like academic disengagement, research orientation, things like that, based on how they answer certain questions. And with this one, we've been doing something a little different. Rather than trying to, uh, to correlate just to say, oh, look, they're more successful, more successful students are also using the library, we're looking for who's not using the library and trying to make some, uh, some decisions about actions that we can take going forward based on that. Um, the one we're really looking at right now is, well, we know that the behavior that we most want to increase is the use of databases, because that's the one where we've seen the most consistent correlation to GPA and retention. Um, it doesn't really matter cause and effect. It, uh, it correlates strongly, so that's what we want to see more of. Um, we know from our data that we can increase that use through mediation. So if you have, for example, attended our Intro to Library Re Research workshop, uh, we can show in our data that not only do you use more databases during that semester, but you subsequently also make more use of the library. That's also the thing we can scale the most because we offer it both as an in-person workshop and as an online learning object. So our next step is to try to reach out to, to students who aren't right now taking the Intro to Library research and, um, and see if we can then see some benefits to them showing in GPA and retention and so on. We have another another question asking for elaboration, sure. uh, and that is actually, can you elaborate on how Siru was used? Um, a little bit, sure. Uh, so the Siru asks again a bunch of questions about. Uh, um, let me think of an example. Uh, things like uh, how often have you used um, information in one course to ask new questions about another course which would be an indication of academic engagement and things like that. And how often have you studied in a group? Um, so it goes way beyond what a GPA could show and more into what's your experience like. Uh, so we've used that to say, well, how much a part of, of, uh, of that experience is using the library, no matter what kind of use it is? We don't know. Again, you can't really say cause and effect on any of this. Um, but it looks to us from what we've seen that Using the library is something that helps you not just find the resources you need, but also become more engaged in other aspects of being a student to being a scholar. So that's kind of how we've used it. We've um, grouped together the questions for specific indicators similar to the ones I just showed on the SERP, um, things like academic engagement and, and scholarship. Those are the two we've looked at the most. I grouped those together and then correlated those and uh, looked for correlations with library use. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Um, this is just a quick, uh, this is, we did this with uh, Intro to Library Research to look at who we have been successful with, and we have been very successful in reaching out to the, the people on the top groups, the international students, students enrolled in academic uh, access to success, the program here at the university. So what we're doing right now is looking at how do we reach out to those students and how can we use what we learn from that to reach out to other groups. Um, a couple of tangible things that we're doing right now. The first is it has to do with the A plus report, which is something, a tool that's used by the academic advisors on campus. Um, what we're doing right now, uh, a, an advisor can bring up this kind of thing, uh, this kind of record for any of the students they're advising, and they can, uh, and they can look at different aspects of what they're doing and their experience. Uh, what we're doing right now is feeding in information about whether the student has taken intro to library research, and that is not a required thing that they have to do. Many students take it as part of their intro to writing class that they take as freshmen, but there are many students who don't have to take that class at all, who test out of it for one reason or another. Um, but there's no reason they couldn't take the one hour intro to library research or do the online tutorials. So we're feeding this information in so that the advisors can look and see, has the student done this? And if not, hopefully, we hope, they will encourage the students to do that. It's going to require a lot of education uh, work between us and the advisors about us understanding what they do and them understanding when it's a good idea to refer a student, what's a marker for them to refer a student to the library. Um, the, the next thing we hope will happen with that is referrals. Right now an advisor can refer a student to some other entity within the university. They can say, oh, you should go talk to somebody and study abroad and they can make a referral, and somebody in that other area would get an email saying you should contact the student, and they can reach out. We hope that we're going to be able to get that working so that an advisor could, could click a button to refer a student to the library that way. Rather than just encouraging the student to stop by, we can then reach out to the student and say, hey, you know, we, you want to set an, up an appointment? Can we do something via email? How can we help you? Um, and then, to the advisors will be able to see it come full circle. We, as the libraries, can then put in information saying, hey, we met with the student, we showed them this and this, and they're moving forward. So that's where we're at right now with this project. So in addition to feeding the information into uh, the A-plus system, is there a university assessment management system you're feeding library data into? Not currently. Not, <laughs> um, that, not currently. There is a lot of work going on in that area uh, within the university. We haven't been asked to contribute our data yet, um, but that is a direction we hope to go. Okay, great. Well, we will now move the ball over to Jennifer Jones, the last of our participants from Georgia State University. So, Jennifer, tell us about how Georgia State has tried to measure its contribution to student success. I will, and thanks. I'm waiting for the ball. Sorry, <laughs> it's moving around on me here. <laughs> oh, I think I accidentally moved it to Drew. Drew, can you move it down, please? Thanks. Sorry. So, inspired by the work done and by the University of Minnesota Libraries, your previous speakers, the Georgia State University Library wanted to investigate whether a relationship existed between library use and students' academic success, and specifically with a first-term GPA. Georgia State has about 32,000 students, and about 28,000 of those are undergraduates. We weren't prepared to invest heavily in this project at first. Um, but we did have some research questions we wanted to answer. So we started out cautiously, and we rely on library usage data that we've already collected because we weren't sure quite how this might turn out. So at first, we looked at library workstation logins, group study room reservations, and attendance at research clinics. So the library has about 400 desktop computers for student needs, and students log in using their campus usernames, so I'm sure as many of your students do, or many of your institutions. Students also must log into an online system with their campus usernames to reserve one of our 60 group study rooms in the library, and, and to track individual attendance at our research clinics, um, or 
basically research clinic is a drop-in research skills workshop as opposed to a library instruction session. So to track attendance of those students swipe their campus ID cards using a portable magnetic swipe reader. So we looked at first-time full-time students who matriculated during the 2010, 2011, and 2012 fall semesters, and it was a total of just over 8,600 cases. And the students' levels of usage of those three library resources that I mentioned earlier. The unique element of the study was that we constructed treatment and control groups with similar background characteristics. That is, students who used library resources were compared to students with similar background characteristics who did not use library resources. And what we found is that students who used library resources at certain levels had a higher term GPA than similar students who did not use library resources. And that was at all levels of usage that we tracked in, and in all three of those usage categories. It's important to note that this study shows a positive correlation and not a cause and effect relationship, with, which is something that um, Jan and Shane mentioned earlier as well. And that there are no limitations of our study. So for example, a group study room reservation is made by one student and tracked um, along one student username, but multiple students use that study room as a group, obviously. So since the first phase of the study, we've also begun collecting um, off-campus database logins. Sorry, I forgot to advance my slide a minute ago. We've also begun collecting off-campus database logins through Easy Proxy, and we're considering recording individual attendance of library instruction sessions, which is obviously something that we don't do now. We also are considering recording in-person reference transactions at our main service point and also one-on-one -on -one research consultations between a student and a librarian. We would like to follow the same cohorts of students to determine their library usage during later semesters and to look at their progression to the next class level retention beyond the sophomore year, which is kind of our tricky year here at Georgia State as far as retention goes, and then time to graduation. Retention, progression, and time to graduation are three big campus indicators that the state of Georgia is, is looking at um, among the public institutions. I want to emphasize that the partnership between the library and the Office of Institutional Research was crucial to the success of this project. Institutional research provided analytical expertise that I don't have, um, plus they have ready access to the student data warehouse. Recently, my co-PI for this project um, in the Office of Institutional Research, left to work at an institution overseas, which is kind of heartbreaking for me. He was a great partner. I'm in, now in the process of working with faculty in the College of Business to continue the project. So not only would we like to track cohorts of student library users to compare their retention progression and time to graduation to those of non-library users, we'd also like to examine additional student campus interactions to create a picture of the successful student at Georgia State University. What characteristics does a successful student have? So that's it for me. There, when, there is one question oh, certainly. Um, that someone had on your previous slide. Okay. And that was, what do you mean by practically significant? You say small, but statistically and practically uh, well, it significant. Was statistically significant, but practically as well, but it was you can look at the term GPA and see that there was a practical increase. That's all that means. Okay, great. Um, so uh, if you would pass the ball back to me, uh, we will go ahead and um, start on discussion and questions. And the first question uh, I have will be for, uh, I'll start with Eric, although it is for all of the um, panelists, and you'll see today's speakers up here on the slide that I just put up. Uh, and so the question I want to ask is, what were the biggest obstacles or challenges you faced in measuring your library's contribution to student success, and how have you overcome them? Oh, I'm up first, okay. Um, I would say getting sort of buy-in from everybody around the group. I mean, I'm a 
not only the head of reference services, but also the assessment librarian. And for years, it's been sort of like, we're really glad that you, you're willing to do this and that you like doing it, but as far as getting other people actually involved in the process, I think that was, was one of the challenges. And then opening up uh, dialogue and uh, collaboration with the institutional research uh, department, as uh, my colleagues in this uh, session have already alluded to, is extremely important, but they were not used to the idea of people actually being interested enough in doing assessment on campus to actually approach them, so they were a little bit uncertain about how to um, work with us. As it turned out, we haven't actually resolved all of the confidentiality issues, and so I haven't really been able to tie much of what we're doing to GPA or uh, re-enrollment or retention. So those are the two biggest challenges, and I'd have to say we're sort of on the way to solving them because we've got a few, as you saw, a few projects going, but not nearly as far along as, say, Minnesota or Georgia State. Okay, and next we'll have Shane and Jan answer that question about the obstacles or challenges and how you overcame them. Um, yeah, our answer mirrors Eric's uh, very nicely. Um, our, one of our biggest obstacles to begin with was uh, convincing our library administration and department heads that uh, we were going to take their data and keep the privacy of the users. Um, the one department in particular, uh, when I asked them for the data about uh, users, uh, told me that uh, she would give me that over her dead body. Um, so, um, she's still alive. <laughs> we actually uh, got the data and we were able to successfully uh, demonstrate that we were going to uh, maintain the privacy of our users uh, through the methods that I was describing. The other obstacle that I would say um, was just the time that it took to, um, to, to craft the partnership with the Office of Institutional Research here at Minnesota. Uh, they're a very busy uh, department and it took a while uh, for us to uh, get on their docket for uh, that partnership. Uh, but once we were there, um, it's been a very fruitful par partnership. I think they've been very impressed with the data that we're able to supply to them and again the strong correlations that we've been able to make with student success. So we've we've even gone beyond uh, the initial study to other studies that Jan was describing. Okay, and before we move on to Jennifer, there was a question about your data uh, and that was, uh, has it been published anywhere? Do you have a sample spreadsheet? Yeah, we put a link into the uh, um, into the chat of both the, our project blog, but then also the list of publications that we've done so far. We've published um, uh, three articles, and there's a book chapter coming out. We've also done uh, many, many presentations on this, which are um, many of which can be found on the blog that we put out there. We can put it out again if you'd like. But the, um, as far that's as far as the publications we have. The data itself we have not um, put out anywhere in any kind of repository, although we're sort of thinking about how we would, might do that, what kind of aggregations would be useful for people. You know, obviously we want to maintain our users' privacy. Um, but a sample spreadsheet, that is actually doable, that is that has state data in it, just so you can see what we do. It's, it's very simple, though. You'd be surprised at how little we actually need to collect in order to find these sorts of results. Yeah, putting I think it all we'd be together. delighted, actually. Yeah. <laughs> putting it all together is a, is a challenge, but then what we send to the Office of Institutes for Research, as Jan just said, is pretty simple, actually. So. Okay, so then let's move on to Jennifer and find out about the obstacles or challenges Georgia State had. Um, first of all, I've lost my video capability, it looks like, so, which might be for the best, but I just want to let you know that before I start to answer that. Um, Probably one of our biggest challenges um, has been getting buy-in at the library level. So among um, library employees, asking them to, for example, track an additional interaction or add something to a library instruction session. For example, having students swipe their campus ID cards at a session or um, asking everyone who interacts with a patron at a service desk to have them swipe a card. Um, because we do want to add additional um, usage points, and so that's probably been one of our biggest challenges. 
um, initially we had an idea for such a project after finding out what the University of Minnesota Libraries was doing and um, we did have a little, I think we weren't sure quite where to start on campus, um, but as soon as we partnered up with institutional research, they were fantastic. So I think those, those initial knowing who to ask and um, on campus, um, it was a challenge at first, but we overcame that pretty quickly. So I think our biggest obstacle is just um, within the library, getting employees to perhaps change how they're doing work. Have you, uh, Jennifer, or also any of the other panelists, uh, have you felt that requiring students to identify themselves at the reference desk or at instruction or whatever acts as a barrier? to them using the service? Um, we haven't had that. We haven't gotten that impression from students. I think um, elsewhere on campus, we are a city-based campus. We're in the heart of downtown Atlanta, um, and we have some buildings that are um, locked down. So students are often um, required to swipe a card to enter a building, for example. Um, they are asked to swipe a card when they attend um, a presentation on campus by a, a speaker through the student services office. Um, so they don't seem to be reluctant to provide um, this information. Um, okay. So we haven't had we haven't had that issue. Okay. So uh, any of the others have anything there? Uh, I've actually we've discussed this before. Uh, we tend to collect aggregated statistics without getting names and student numbers and there would be a great deal of resistance among the librarians from doing that for this very reason. Uh, we don't want to discourage anybody from contacting this and we are concerned that that would be a barrier. Whether it would play out or not is difficult to say. We're not an institution that is in a situation where we use a lot of swiping of cards to get in and out of things or to be involved. So because our students are not used to that kind of thing, it may actually backfire on us. So that's going to be a very tricky one to figure out. But no, we don't for that reason. Okay, thank you. It looks like we've lost our video, but we'll just kick in too. We are also a very large uh, urban campus and Students swipe all the time, but not in the libraries. Um, I think that if we had a formal uh, advisory committee of students, that's something we'd really want to talk to them about. Uh, because, yeah, we do feel like swiping at a reference desk, well, that's an extra thing to ask. We could make it optional or something like that. But, um, but on the other hand, our students don't seem reluctant to swipe other places. And as a result, our uh, study is we don't require anybody to give um, or the internet ID, they just do to use our resources and that's where we capture it. So uh, we're not asking for it uh, for the study that we're, you know, we're asking for it for just logging into the resources that they're trying to use. Okay. Um, so a bit of uh, difference in the universities here, uh, particularly rural urban split on this one. Um, and this is a question from the participants uh, getting back to something Eric first brought up, uh, and that was cause versus correlation. Uh, and so someone wanted to know if you found any way to find cause instead of just correlation uh, between use of library resources and services and student retention and success. Um, so Minnesota folks, the camera's on you right now, so we'll start with you. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, that's very, very hard to do in any kind of study like this. This isn't just a library thing. One of the things that Krista, again, our OIR analyst, one of the things she's done with her regression analysis that she's done on this data is she can, for specific things, she can say of the things we're measuring, it looks like the library contributes about this much. Um, so she has long formulas that you can look at and kind of see. But the bottom line is we don't really know if, you know, I'm not sure what that would tell us exactly. Is it saying they checked out a book so they have a higher GPA, they, they got a higher grade? Or is it saying they understood how to work as a student within a large university and that's why uh, they got a higher grade? So I, I'm, we get that question a lot and we do try to emphasize that we are showing correlations, not causation. 
Um, but I'm not sure that it would really help us that much if we got that actual cause part, um, if we could do that, because I think we still wouldn't really know why. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything you want to add? No, I really don't have anything to add. I think Jan summed it up very well. There are uh, quite a few variables, and, and I would agree that even if some kind of cause could be proven, I don't know. I don't know how helpful that would be. Okay, well, this ties in with a question we have uh, from the audience uh, in terms of uh, factoring out academic ability, say that it's not only academically strong students who benefit from using the library, but other students as well. And so the audience member wanted to know, uh, is this appropriate and doable analysis? Have any of you done this? And if so, what were the results? So are we just helping those who are already strong? Yeah, that would be the first assumption, wouldn't it? Um, and that's why that is actually the first thing our analysts did after we had done a kind of a, oh, look, you, library user high, higher GPA and just a straight, you know, bar chart kind of thing uh, was to break out, okay, let's look for different groups by um, ACT score. And we showed all the way down the line from above 19 up to 36. No matter what your ACT score was, the, the average GPA was higher for the people who'd used the libraries than those who hadn't. And then she did do a full regression analysis with a lot of different factors that are known to be correlated to student success, to GPA and retention, um, living in a residence hall, um, prior academic experience, and so on. So yeah, we, we have used that work, and that was that's actually what makes us a lot more convinced that this work is worth continuing. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, how about you? We also looked at a, a, a number of background characteristics as well, including um, we were looking at first-time, full-time students in their first semester. So we looked at SAT verbal um, and SAT math and AP credits that were transferred. So we looked at some other background characteristics as well of, this, of the students in our analysis. Okay, and Eric, how about you? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but I would kill for an, a regression analysis along those lines. <laughs> <laughs> we are unfortunately not to that level yet, but I've definitely got that uh, on my radar. I'd like to just briefly mention something of the advantages of causation over correlation is I agree with what everybody else has said so far, but I would like to point out I think at least from our perspective, we're getting the pressure for causation from non-library and stakeholders. For example, uh, at the higher administration, they find that, you know, when they're having to present to the Board of Visitors or to the President or even to the legislature, that causation can give you a lot more clout. So that might be one motivation for pursuing that. Now, whether it's obtainable or not, I think is yet to be proven, but I just thought I would throw that out. Okay, well, Eric, we'll start with you on uh, the next question, which is about IRB approval and whether you had any hurdles in getting approval. Um, did you need to rethink or rewrite any sections? Well, we kind of had a, a an inside player on this, we had recruited the Director of Academic Assessment to be on our uh, Assessment and Action team, and she has already built up a lot of rapport with the uh, IRB people about how to approach them for confidentiality uh, statements, how do you get to consent. Actually, sorry, not confidentiality, consent statements from students was our big sticking point. And she showed us how to navigate uh, through that so that it wouldn't become a burden to the study and yet protect the students. So um, it was a hurdle, but we had someone who could walk us through it. Um, as far as rethinking specific sections, I find that the actual process itself as we do it here is very much conducive to uh, rethinking and sort of refining what it is you want to do as you fill out the initial form. Uh, also, we uh, can get quite a bit of good feedback, positive feedback in 
well, I consider anything that improves it a positive feedback uh, as well. So, um, so, so you're modeling people. what we try to teach our students. Research is an iterative process. <laughs> Absolutely. So is IRB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Shane and Jan, do you have anything to add? We uh, we filled out an IRB, uh, and the only pushback we got from them was concerning how we would report the data. They wanted to make sure that we would report in the aggregate rather than uh, report on specific students and how they use the libraries. Once we were able to show that uh, we would report in the aggregate, uh, they gave us an exemption to the IRB process. So that's how we went through that. Okay, and then Jennifer. We did not have any uh, hurdles. Um, everything went through just fine. I think it helped that the research analyst in institutional research with whom I worked had um, done a previous study regarding um, academic advising. And, and so I think a lot of the pieces he was able to adapt from a previous IRB application. Yeah, so it sounds from all of you that uh, working with institutional research is a very good thing. Um, we have a question specifically for the Minnesota folks. Uh, how, if at all, do you track online transactions, for example, virtual reference? Uh, we track through the OCLC's question point software. Um, so we go through the question point data uh, semester to semester and extract out again the University of Minnesota Internet IDs. Um, and then um, and that's how we do reference. We do not do face-to-face uh, -face reference transactions or reference desk transactions because we do not ask for a card swipe or students to give the Internet ID when they're uh, asking a reference question. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have about uh, eight more minutes to go. Uh, so I want to say ask each of the, the groups, starting with Jennifer, um, what would be your advice to a library that is just starting out on trying to measure student success? Uh, how should they proceed? My advice is to start is to just start. Um, and we, we relied on the low-hanging fruit, which I mentioned earlier. Um, we decided not to track things or attempt to track library usage that we weren't already collecting. So. It was point, two points at which students had to log in with their usernames anyway. Um, and then we did have attendees at the clinics um, swipe. And so I would start with whatever your low hanging fruit is. So if you already are collecting, in our case, we are relying on individual late, late individual level data. If there are points at which you can collect this information before you purge it, um, and clean it up and send it to your Office of Institutional Research. Go ahead and start doing that. And in the meantime, um, find out who your friends are in institutional research. Um, I had made some contacts there prior to um, starting this study when we were launching live, a large-scale surveys from the library. Um, so I developed some relationships that way initially and then was put in touch with a research analyst in the office to work on this project, and he was extremely enthusiastic, very helpful. So just start talking to people in that office if you think that is going to be your, um, if, that they're going to be your partners in this. Okay, thank you. And before we move to Eric, um, Jennifer, if you could just put the URL back up, or I guess I, I could, if, what people meant was the that URL. Um, I can do that. All right. Uh, okay. So, Eric, what about you? What would be your advice to a library that is just starting out? Well, pretty much what uh, what Jennifer just said. Uh, I think what's really helped the most for me was that longer, the to over time, building up the relationship with. Uh, first, uh, academic, uh, Department of Academic Assessment before it became part of uh, institutional research and then after with institutional research. Uh, that's been, and like 
Jennifer. We ha I'd had previous experience doing uh, large-scale surveys, mainly live qual, since 2005, so we built up a long-term relationship with uh, the Director of Academic Assessment, and so that sort of helped ease things along, and we started branching out into other areas, so I highly recommend that. Okay, and finally, uh, Minnesota folks, what advice do you have? Uh, our answer will be remarkably similar. Um, I think Jennifer hit the nail on the head. To start with uh, what you're already collecting, take a look at that. In our case, we identified uh, 13 different areas where we could use what we're already collecting and then uh, also collect that Internet ID that is so vital for figuring out who those users are. Uh, and then again, with both Eric and Jennifer, um, find your friend on campus, your friends on campus. In our case, it was the Office of Institutional Research, and we started to communicate with them and share our data with them, and uh, it's been a very mutually beneficial partnership. Okay, so uh, another question for all the panelists. Uh, what staff resources and other resources in terms of software or anything else did you need to conduct your project? And Eric, we'll start with you. Uh, I would have to say uh, some really good qualitative analysis software. It's uh, We use Deduce at the moment, but I've also used Atlas TI, and I know a lot of campuses have campus-wide licenses for in vivo or something, because inevitably you will run into all sorts of comment data that you really want to take a look at. And uh, then as far as for quantitative, uh, SPSS or Excel, depends on what you're comfortable with. I've, I actually use both, you know, depending on what, exact, what I'm doing. Uh, as far as skills, I know we've seen uh, a lot of different ways to approach it. I've sort of uh, self-taught in terms of quantitative and qualitative skills, but I can certainly learn more and do all the time. Uh, but also knowing where you can get them, as, as others have said, Jennifer and Janet and Shane have said, and that is if you don't have them, go to the institutional research or find somebody that does. I actually had, when we were doing earlier survey research, uh, a sociology professor contact me and asked out of the blue and ask if we needed help or anything like that. I took it as a compliment rather than, oh my God, what kind of surveys are you <laughs> sending out? So, but so you never know once you get going with this, what kind of people will step forward and offer to help. Okay, Shane and Jan, do you have anything to add in terms of of uh, the resources needed? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it, what needed is one thing and what you can do is another, I guess. Um, we've made very heavy use uh, outside of the actual collection of the data as we put it all together, kind of the data wrangling part of it. Um, I use Microsoft Access. We use uh, a lot of Excel once we get the demographics back just to do quick things, um, pivot tables and charts and things like that. Um, our analyst, Krista, uses SPSS to do the real the statistical work. Um, and uh, I don't know, anything else? Well, we have a team of four. It's yeah. uh, me and Jan, and then uh, two other librarians, Krista Mastel and Kate Peterson. Um, and then we have used uh, web development staff, our department of web development staff, to help us uh, uh, gather up a lot of the online um, uh, electronic uh, data usage statistics. So. Yeah, I guess I kind of focused on the, the actual technical skills and, and software that we've used, but the soft skills also are really important, uh, having people involved, having Kristen and, um, and Kate involved with the project mm -hmm. who work with end users, different uh, pools of end users a lot, um, has given us a lot of depth as we look at what do these things mean. Okay, I'm going to skip asking Jennifer because we've gotten a really good question uh, from the audience. And I want to give some time to that. So, Jennifer, I will actually let you go first in answering it. Um, do you think that students are so different at each campus that every library needs to be doing these studies? Or can we extrapolate your findings to a general understanding of the impact of libraries on student success? Can we establish some best practices based on these studies? That is a really good question. I um, I feel like students are pretty different on each campus. I know at our, on our campus, I mentioned where it's located, 
Our average undergraduate age is about 26. Um, students take an average of nine and a half, I think, credit hours per semester. So we're still largely a part-time commuter campus. We have about 4,000 beds for 32,000 students on campus housing. So I kind of feel like maybe students are pretty different and our institutions are serving very different populations. Um, but I think perhaps some, perhaps as more of these studies are um, completed, we can look and see what the trends are across institutions. But I feel like at this point, um, maybe more of your institutions need to start working on projects like this and we can see what trends emerge across all or more institutions. Um, I would feel nervous about extrapolating any of the results that I read about at other institutions um, for my student population. I, I don't feel like it's a real traditional student population and, and I don't know that I would feel comfortable doing that, but I'd like to hear from others. So, Eric, what about you with Bradford being very different from Georgia State? Uh, well, my answer was, when I read it, was initially yes and no. Uh, like anything, I think best practices comes out of quite a few initial studies across different kinds of campuses. And I think this was one of the goals of the Assessment and Action Grant. At the end of three years, they want to have 300 uh, libraries who have gone through it and hopefully as a side effect, so to speak, would be best practices would actually emerge from all these projects. And so I have to agree with, uh, with Jennifer that I wouldn't just simply pull the data and say, oh look, here's a semi-rural regional university of about 10,000 people, that must be like ours. Well, it would be. There would be a lot of similarities, but I think I would be reluctant to, to make any real decisions on that data that we didn't gather here. Think of it in terms of if you do, say, LiveQual. Well, you don't actually have to create the survey. You don't have to create the metrics. You don't have to do all that. You simply administer the survey, but your results, while they may be similar to others, are going to have some unique components. So I kind of see where that's, this may be going, what everybody's doing here. Okay, Shane and Jan, we will give you the last word, um, but I also want to add a question that came from the audience unrelated to this, um, and that is, if you make the sample spreadsheet available, where will people be able to find it? Uh, we're going to send it in to you guys, and you guys are going to put it in a place where people can download it. We've had a little back channel going on here to, to take care of that, so it'll be available okay. to download. Okay. And so what about in terms of the question uh, about uh, I'll try how to, universal? It helps, it helps a lot when we're in conversations to be able to point and say, look, we did this work here, and we saw these correlations. Um, that said, I, I think that most institutions can probably assume that if they do the same work that we did with GPA and retention, it's so far everybody else who's done it has pretty much seen those same things. Um, so I, I think you can assume you're going to see that and you don't have to be afraid to do the analysis um, that you're going to see something that you really don't want to, like the libraries have no impact whatsoever. Um, but uh, that said, I think what the others have said is exactly right. Our campuses, our student bodies, the things that we value um, are, are, and the challenges we have could be really different. Um, you know, we all value higher GPAs and retention, uh, particularly retention is something we look at so closely. But the reasons why students aren't retained could vary a whole lot from one institution to another. Okay, thank you. And uh, I want to thank all the panelists for their participation and also the audience. And I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Julie now to wrap things up. I just want to thank um, UB for moderating the discussion today, and I want to thank all the panelists for um, sharing their expertise with us. I thought that last question was especially helpful and a really great way to tie all this up today. Um, so we will be having 
someone told me to move my mic down. <laughs> anyway, I was just thanking everyone. <laughs> Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you to all the speakers. We will be having a uh, another discussion in the spring. The topic is to be determined. So um, you can help us determine that by filling out the survey that we are going to send out to everyone that uh, is registered today. So you'll get the survey. So please fill that out. And then with the survey, you'll also get the recording for this. So you'll have that for your archives and you can share it with your colleagues and friends. And then anyone who wasn't able to make it today can uh, watch that when it's convenient for them. So in the meantime, just look um, on the blog, on the Facebook page, on the ULS list listserv, and we'll get the promotion out to you sometime early mid-spring. So thanks a lot, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving.